this is a presentation on um, insolvency. You might argue it's quite good timing or bad timing, depending on your viewpoint. Um, I'd also like to apologize for the fact I sound like I might come from Dudley in the West Midlands. Nothing wrong if you come from the West Midlands, but I'm a man suffering a cold and therefore I'm making a big deal of it. Um, today you have me, uh, Andrew Rush, and also we have Lucy here. Hello everyone, nice who, to meet you all. Who is going to do half the presentation, we'll split it up so um, it doesn't get quite as boring listening to my West Midlands voice all the way through. Mm -hmm. So, insolvency and how to deal with it. So the first thing, um, hopefully I can uh, go down, how do I go down, that one? No? Mm -hmm. Do, where are we that one. <laughs> So um, we just get different different webinar systems and they're all slightly different. Right, what's going on at the moment? Well, what's going on at the moment is contractors are going into insolvency and our subcontractors. So um, on the screen, we've got some examples of recent ones that we've um, encountered when acting on the other side. So a good example um, is Mid Group, who went into insolvency probably sort of July time last year, they um, hadn't paid their subcontractors for five months. Um, there's also WRW, which is hidden by the, the question mark there. Um, they had a turnover of 64 million. And when they went into insolvency, they, on their own volition, um, said that they owed creditors uh, 30 million. So there is a wave of insolvency going on in the construction industry at the moment. It tends to be contractors of a certain size who have um, priced five to 10 million pound jobs and the effect of price changes and labor have made a real difference. Or it tends to be subcontractors of a certain size who have, um, and they tend to be the sort of smaller subcontractors and the medium contractors who are struggling, uh, possibly because some of the contracts they've got, the contractors have gone bust and therefore take them with them. So we have this underlying insolvency issue in the market. So what the, the purpose of today really is just to give you some basics, because there is some significant misunderstanding around insolvency um, and then come on to what you might be able to do and some issues around you know, what's available and how the contracts work. So the basics. Insolvency in the construction industry is, is relatively common and the construction industry is responsible for the highest number of um, new company insolvencies always is the case it's it's the sort of um the, the weather barometer of what's going on in in the general um yeah whether there's a recession whether or not and what tends to happen with um insolvency with in construction is you know take for example carillion when Carillion went into insolvency, it wasn't necessarily the contract someone had with Carillion. It was the fact that that party hadn't been paid. Therefore, they wouldn't pay on another contract. So you end up with this knock on effect when someone goes into insolvency somewhere it has a ripple effect on other contracts. So the first sort of legal point is, you know, what is meant by insolvency? Well, it's a bit like practical completion. It's not particularly obvious. It's not um, so it's not definable in one sense, but it is more obvious when you see it. So you know when a building achieves practical completion and you sort of know when a party's going into insolvency. From a legal perspective, section 123 of the Insolvency Act defines what amounts to unable to pay its debts. And that consists of a statutory demand not being met, a failure to satisfy a county court judgment, um, a court satisfied that a party is unable to pay its debts, which is normally via a winding up petition. And in other circumstances, the court being satisfied that a company's liabilities exceed its assets. Now, a lot of construction companies would fall under the bottom category in any event, but most construction companies fail because of cash flow, not because the, the, their liabilities exceed their assets. So at any one point in time, if you can't pay your supply chain, Theoretically, you are insolvent. Uh, this is a extract from a famous case called Gilbert Ash uh, and Modern Engineering. This was a famous uh, quote from Lord Denning. The main point, if you read halfway down, 
um, he says there must be a cash flow in the building trade. It is the very lifeblood of the enterprise. And you might have heard the expression, cash flow is the lifeblood of the construction issue. Well, that's where it comes from. The final sentence is perhaps um, the most important. The employer must pay the main contractor, the main contractor must pay the subcontractor and so forth for the construction industry to work. Now, this was said in, um, I think Gilbert Ash was the mid eighties and the position remains the same now, that if there is a break in the chain where someone is not paying, that is what ultimately leads to insolvency. So what are the types of insolvency that exist? And this is one of the issues that people get wrong. Um, not least because the BBC News will often say Carillion have gone bankrupt. Well, Carillion would never go bankrupt. Carillion went into insolvency. Individuals go bankrupt. Companies go into insolvency. What forms of insolvency do companies go into? Well, there are essentially four. The administration, company voluntary arrangement, liquidation and LPA receiver. The top two theoretically at least, are there to enable the company to continue to trade and come back out and therefore effectively become come out of insolvency and become solvent. The bottom two are not the case. The problem with most construction companies is there is no easy way to, to trade, and we'll come on to why, but in principle, all the contracts have come to an end the moment the party goes into administration, so there's nothing to go back to to trade. So in practice, despite the differences, with the exception of the company voluntary arrangement, which I'll come on to, despite the differences, almost always when a contractor goes into some form of insolvency, it will ultimately end up in liquidation, and that's the end of that contractor. So what is administration? Uh, this is perhaps the one that most large companies will um, you'll hear about going into first. So it's a procedure under the Insolvency Act where a company um, can effectively go into what's called a moratorium period to enable it to decide what it's going to do going forwards, whether it can trade out or whether it needs to then subsequently move to liquidation. If you take, for example, a sort of a Woolworths, that's a bit old, isn't it, um, or a you know, a Debenhams or something, they have assets to trade. It's possible for someone to come and buy them. Um, so often they, you know, administration is a precursor to them potentially coming back out in one form or another. In construction, it doesn't work quite that way. There are very few assets to be purchased. All the contracts have effectively come to an end. And so administration typically is just a phase where the um, contractor has a pause to consider what it's doing next. Administration is commenced often, not always, but often by what is known as a notice of intention to appoint an administrator. Now that is not, and it's important to understand this, that is not insolvency for the purposes of JCT or NEC, which, which Lucy will come on to in a moment. It, it's the first, what you might call interim or initial moratorium period. It gives the company 10 days to decide if they're going to appoint an administrator. So you will often see a company has got a notice of intention to appoint an administrator. It's not the same as actually having one appointed. It's relevant because you can't terminate your contract or, or any other of the actions that come under the JCT or NEC because they're not at that point strictly insolvent. Now, it's fairly clear that they're going to go into administration, but you have to wait your time until they then do move into administration. Once you've moved into an administration, you then have what you might call a secondary moratorium period, which can be increased, can, can last as long as 40 days. And in fact, um, often some administrations can go on for years. But normally in construction terms, they are used then as a pause before you move into liquidation. So that's administration as a concept. So I want to use the mouse. Um, the second one is company voluntary arrangement. Now, there are companies in CVAs who um, are still trading. They're trading outside of the CVA and they've done a deal with their creditors at a point in time um, where they were in trouble. They've agreed with their creditors a, a payment, whether it be 50p in the pound, 90p in the pound spread over a long period. 
and enables them to then continue trading thereafter. So it's a formal arrangement with creditors. The way a company voluntary arrangement works is a proposal is put to the creditors and if 75% by value agree that proposal, then a company can go into a company voluntary arrangement. So if you have one very large creditor, it will effectively be their choice whether the company goes into a CVA or not. Often, not always, but often that may be HMRC. Um, and they have to say, I have to say they are not particularly keen on CVAs, but if it's another type of um, large creditor, that's more likely. This is, this is only really a solution for contractors when they have assets. So, you know, if a contractor owns lots of property, lots of plant, which it could sell, therefore to enable it to raise money to pay its creditors, it's possible. It is unusual, but not unheard of for contractors to go into company voluntary arrangement. The sort of first final option is liquidation. Um, this is essentially what happens to a company when it goes into a formal insolvency, is wound up, all the assets are sold, liabilities are paid off, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. This is what happens, yeah, this is what happened to Carillion. These processes in liquidation can take years. Um, but ultimately what happens is the company goes into liquidation, and then there's a system of if there's any money in the company, it's paid against a set of uh, creditors in an order, which I'll come on to in a moment. There are types of liquidation, but the ones you'll all be aware of, the, the, the headline grabbing ones, is essentially which are driven by a winding up petition. If someone issues a winding up petition, typically a creditor who's owed money, if that's not paid off, ultimately that company will be put into liquidation via a winding up petition hearing. There are other types of liquidation, like voluntary, where the members decide just to close the company down. They should be in a scenario where the company actually is solvent. It's still a liquidation, it's a solvent liquidation. What we talk about, what we're talking about here is an insolvent liquidation where there is a winding up and the company's put under. The final version is the LPA receiver. So receivership, with people often you will say, oh, the receiver's been appointed. Um, that's not, again, receivership as a general concept no longer exists, but an LPA receiver is a receiver that's that's in relation to a fixed charge over the property. So if you're, and you might come across this if you're working for an SPV that owns one property, if ultimately the employer, the SPV goes into insolvency, the bank typically will put in an LPA receiver to get that building finished so the bank can realize their money. That's effectively what an LPA receiver is there to do. It's a slightly different thing to a, an administrator or liquidator who's there to realize everything. The LPA receiver is just involved with the particular property. So you might come across that example as well in your travels, if you're unfortunate enough. <clears throat> so I just alluded to the fact that in an insolvency, there is an order as to the way creditors are paid. And it won't come as any massive surprise that the bank come first, and it shouldn't come as any massive surprise that the insolvency practitioner, be the administrator or liquidator, will come second, because they're not going to do this process unless they get paid. What then follows from that is that preferential creditors, which include employees up to the grand total of £800, come next, and then you have certain elements of HMRC, certain other types of charge holder. So you've got a whole bunch of people who are going to get paid first. Then you get unsecured creditors. Now, in the scenario where you are owed money by an insolvent company, you are an unsecured creditor. Finally, if you're a shareholder, you come last, but trust me, they don't get any money. Um, a thing that is often confused, the fact you have a court judgment does not mean you are a secured creditor. The fact you have an interim charge does not mean you are a secured creditor. The only way you become a secured creditor is to have a fixed charge over assets, um, which you know, is something you cannot do very quickly. So if you're owed money and someone goes into insolvency, you will be at the bottom of the list. And typically for contract construction companies and typically contractors, um, the amount of money you get in the pound is typically nil. So in other words, you get nothing. It's not always the case, but often they are, they are so much money and there's so many creditors ranking ahead of you as an unsecured creditor that you'll get nothing.
So before Lucy comes on to the detail, just a sort of standard position. So larger companies tend to go into administration first. And as I've explained, there tends to be a 10 day period before that administration even starts. What happens on site when this happens? So some subcontractors will still be working. Only once the administrators appointed will those subcontractors typically stop. At that point, once the administration kicks in, JCT and NEC terms will apply and you'll see how they apply. And they're very, what you might call the non-insolvent company friendly. And administration will often um, only last a couple of months because the administrator will know full well the company needs to go into liquidation. And then what you've got to be asking yourself if you're on the site is what's happening to the materials? How do I start working with a new contractor? And I put the item there, credit insurance, because credit insurance pays out if you have it on an insolvency. And administration is an insolvency. So ironically, if you have credit insurance, a party going into a form of insolvency enables you to get the money. For smaller companies like subcontractors, typically there's less drama. You don't hear about it as much. They just don't turn up or they're no longer available. And what you tend to get in those circumstances is a letter from the liquidator that says, so-and-so has gone bust. Please let us know if you owed any money. Um, there'll be a creditors meeting. It's a very slow process. It's not some, it's not a fast moving as, as the um, administration. And again, as I put on the bottom there, if you do have credit insurance, um, then potentially that can be recovered. So I'm just going to pass you over to Lucy, who is going to talk you through the standard forms. Thank you. So moving on to the standard forms. In this section, we're going to look at what the standard form contracts say about insolvency, focusing on the two most widely used standard form contracts, which are, of course, JCT and NEC. Under a JCT main contract, all of the key contracts, so design and build, standard form and intermediate, define insolvency in the termination section, which is at section eight. As you can see on the slides, a company is considered insolvent when one of the following occurs. It enters into administration when an administrative receiver has been appointed, on the passing of a resolution for a voluntary winding up, on the making of a winding up order, or finally, where a company voluntary arrangement has been entered into. One important point to note is that a notice of intention to appoint an administrator doesn't amount to insolvency for the purposes of the JCT definition. We'll come on to why that is significant in a moment. For a partnership, the relevant trigger is the making of a winding up order against the partnership. And for an individual, it's the making of a bankruptcy order. It's probably worth us mentioning the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, which was introduced during the COVID-19 pan pandemic. Under the Act, two new restructuring and insolvency measures were introduced, which are applicable to companies the statutory moratorium under Part A1 and the restructuring plan procedure under Part 26A. Neither of these are likely to be covered by the definition of insolvency under JCT. So even in circumstances where a formal insolvency procedure has started, the company will not be considered insolvent for the purposes of the contract. So why does this matter? Well, under Clause 8.5.1, the employer is entitled to terminate the contractor's employment at any time by giving notice if the contractor is insolvent. This means insolvent is defined under the contract. It's worth noting that unlike other rights to terminate under JCT, which require two notices, where the contractor is insolvent, the employer only needs to give one notice to terminate. A further important point to note is that there's no right to terminate for insolvency at common law. And in the absence of a contractual right, insolvency itself is not considered to be a breach of contract. This means that to terminate for insolvency, the insolvent party must actually be insolvent as defined under the contract. We'll talk a little later about the practical difficulties that can arise from this. If you're including a requirement that the contractor procures a performance bond within your contracts, it's worth remembering that the ABI form of bond which is widely accepted by sureties, does not expressly deal with insolvency. 
the bond is triggered on a breach of the underlying contract. As insolvency itself is not a breach of contract, a contractor's insolvency alone will not trigger the bond. So far, we've concentrated on insolvency and the rights to terminate, but it's important to remember that under the JCT contract, it's not all about termination. There is a common misconception that in order for the employer's rights on insolvency to arise, the contract must first be terminated. But clause 8.5.3 makes it clear that these rights apply from the date the contractor is insolvent, whether or not the employer has given a notice of termination. So what happens on insolvency? The contract tells us that clauses 8.7.3 to 8.7.5 apply, and we'll look at those clauses in more detail on the next slide. Unsurprisingly, the contractor is no, like, sorry, no longer required to carry out the works and will likely not be in any position to do so anyway. Finally, the employer is entitled to secure the site. This is where things can get a bit tricky. If you've ever been involved in a project where the contractor has become insolvent, you will know that subcontractors and suppliers are often not very keen on leaving their materials on site, especially as it's likely they will not have been paid for those materials yet. It's a complicated area of law, but regardless of what those subcontractors and suppliers have agreed with the contractor, it's highly likely that the employer will have good titles to the materials that remain on site. So the employer should be securing the site to prevent them from disappearing. Coming back to clauses 8.7.3 to 8.7.5, these clauses deal with the payments due following insolvency. First and foremost, the JCT contract makes it clear that no further sums become due to an insolvent contractor. 8.7.3 deals with whether or not a pay less notice must be issued. The basic rule is that if a payment has already been certified, a pay less notice should be issued. If the employer can't issue a pay less notice because the last date for issuing one has passed, by the time that contractor becomes insolvent, a pay less notice is not required. In Melville Dundas, which is the case that's on the slide, the court considered the interaction between the insolvency legislation and the Construction Act. It effectively decided that the Insolvency Act trumps the Construction Act, meaning it's not strictly necessary to issue a pay less notice at all. Our advice would still be to follow the contract and issue a notice if it is possible to in the timescales. 8.7.4 and 8.7.5 deal with the final account on insolvency. This is a calculation of the sums due to the contractor for the work carried out up to the date of the insolvency less the total cost to the employer of completing the works. The position under JCT is that the final account is not prepared until after completion of the entirety of the works and completion of the defects plus a further three months. This is essentially when the financial position is known by the employer. Whilst clause 8.7.5 anticipates that sums may be payable to the contractor, it's very unlikely that this would be the case once all costs to the employer have been assessed. It's worth noting that there is a wide interpretation of costs that the employer is entitled to claim that flow from the termination. For those of you who've been around a while, you may remember the 2005 form of JCT contract, which allowed the employer to claim only their direct costs. This has since changed so that all costs are claimable by the employer. So in reality, it's unlikely that the final account will ever result in sums due to the contractor. As with the JCT contract, the NEC definition of insolvency is set out in the termination section. This is dealt with at clause 91.1. As you can see, the definition of insolvency under the NEC contract does not significantly differ from that under the JCT. The key point to note really is that like with the JCT contract, the notice to appoint an administrator is not considered an insolvency event for the purposes of the NEC contract. Unlike the JCT contract, the client's rights where the contractor is insolvent flow from the termination. So until the project manager has issued a termination certificate, the client's rights on insolvency will not have arisen. The NEC contract applies different procedures on termination and different methods for the assessment of the amount due, depending on the reason for the termination. 
Termination for insolvency will entitle the client to procedure P1, P2 and P3 and amounts A1 and A3. This all sounds very complicated, but in essence, it's very similar to the JCT approach. The applicable termination procedure is dealt with at clause 92. And as with the JCT contract, the client is able to engage others to complete the works, use plant and material to which it has title, and ask the contractor to stop the works and leave site. The client also has the ability to instruct the contractor to assign the benefit of any subcontracts or supply agreements, although how helpful this is in practice is questionable, as it depends on the contractor having the ability to assign those agreements or subcontracts. Payment on termination for insolvency is dealt with at Clause 93, and as with JCT, the contractor is entitled to be paid for works properly carried out up to the date of termination. This is assessed depending on the pricing option applicable to the contract. The key difference with the NEC approach is that rather than waiting until all of the works are completed and the actual costs are known, the project manager makes a prediction of the likely costs to the client for completing the works. This forecast final account needs to be certified within 13 weeks of the termination, which could be significantly in advance of when the actual costs are known. The value of this forecast will, of course, need to be carefully considered by the project manager. This is to avoid a situation where the costs of the final works have been undervalued and the client is obliged to pay an insolvent contractor. That would be something that's not likely to go down very well with the client. So what does all of this mean? Well, basically, if a contractor goes into insolvency, the employer holds all of the cards, mainly because they no longer have to pay the contractor and can dictate whether or not the works are to continue, but also because the employer has rights over plant, equipment and materials that are already on site. So when a party is going insolvent, what should you do? We've just spent some time talking about how the standard form contracts deal with insolvency. There will inevitably be a period of time where it becomes clear to everyone involved in a project that the contractor is heading towards insolvency, but before they are actually consolvent, sorry, insolvent for the purposes of the building contract. Some of the common warning signs are on the slide. One of the first signs might be that the contractor's employees and subcontractors just stop turning up or there might be a general slowing in the progress of the works. It's also likely that there will be some rumours flying around, particularly if the supply chain have not been paid. Whilst it's very important to be aware of these indicators, the key point here is that none of these things alone amount to the contractor being insolvent for the purposes of the contract. So the rights available to the employer under the building contract for dealing with insolvency will not yet have arisen. So what should you do? It's probably stating the obvious, but no one's going to thank a project manager who pays a contractor for things that aren't strictly payable, especially if that contractor then becomes insolvent. Of course, until the right to stop paying under the contract arises, an employer is still obliged to comply with the Construction Act. So not paying is not an option. But it's often the case that interim valuations are not valued in accordance with the contract. For instance, Neither the JCT or NEC allow for on-account payments or for payments of materials that are prematurely on site. So basically only pay for things if you absolutely have to in accordance with the contract. If an interim payment has already been certified, there's always the option to revisit this and issue a pay less notice. Also, if there are any outstanding subcontractor collateral warranties, it would be sensible to ensure they're completed as soon as possible. This is to give the employer a direct contractual link to subcontractors in the event of a future claim. This also allows the employer the ability to step into the relevant underlying subcontract. So to summarise what you should do in the event of insolvency, the first step is to establish whether the contractor or subcontractor is actually insolvent for the purposes of your contract. If they are and if the contract allows it, don't pay them. The next step is to take measures to secure plant equipment and machinery. You should then review payment obligations to subcontractors, consultants and suppliers. It may be that you have the right to an assignment or novation of the contracts, 
or you may be able to agree new contracts with the subcontractors and suppliers. People often think that they must terminate the contract immediately, but this is not always the case, and all options should be explored before taking this step. For instance, depending on the progress of the works, it might be better to omit elements of the works from the contractor and agree direct pay payments to the supply chain. If there are outstanding collateral warranties from subcontractors, it would be a good idea to get these finalised quickly. Finally, knowledge is power, so make sure that you are monitoring any insolvency proceedings as they develop. So finally, whilst it's clear that the employer really holds all of the cards where a contractor is insolvent, there are amend amendments that can be made to the standard form contracts to better protect the employer's position. The key way to do this is to widen the definition of insolvency. And the main thing to include is the notice of the intention to appoint an administrator. It would also be sensible to include the statutory moratorium and the restructuring plan procedure under the new corporate insolvency legislation. You could even go one step further and introduce a clause which includes suspicion of insolvency. There's an example of such clause along those lines on the slide, although quite how easy it is to show a reasonable belief is open to interpretation. If you're dealing with the NEC contract, it would be very wise to amend clause 53.1 so that the period for the final assessment by the project manager is significantly longer than 13 weeks. Lastly, if you're including a performance bond requirement in your contract and the form of bond is based on the ABI bond, it's worth remembering that insolvency is not a breach for the purposes of the ABI bond, so itself will not trigger the protection offered by the bond. It would be better to use a bespoke form of bond or amend the ABI bond so that insolvency is expressly dealt with. I'll pass you on to Andrew, who will discuss insolvency and adjudication. <clears throat> so can an insolvent party adjudicate? So for those of you who um, are dull enough to follow all the case law, there's quite a lot of recent case law on this. Um, so, and it's, it's definitely one of those things that is um, constantly in question. So the first, the, the question is, what is the fundamental problem with allowing an insolvent company to adjudicate? Because on one level, if that company is owed money, why shouldn't it be paid that money? Well, the answer is simply that an adjudication is a temporary decision, not a final decision. And, you know, there are suggestions that some adjudicators are better than others. There are suggestions that some adjudication decisions are perhaps more correct than others. And so what the court's trying to grapple with is the idea that a party should be paid whilst having only a temporary decision versus a permanent decision. You, I'm going to come on to a case called Bresco and John Doyle and another recent case. But you know, this, this area is continuing to develop. It develops almost on a sort of monthly basis. But there are some principles that appear to be coming out of the um, case law. The first one is Bresco versus Lonsdale. So um, this was actually a job at St. James's Park. Uh, Lonsdale were the electrical subcontractor. Bresco were the sub subcontractor. Um, as with all these things, um, you know, one party blamed the other. There was a termination. One party said the other was in refugiatory breach. The other party said no, they weren't. And they each had a claim from each party. This went off to ultimately the Supreme Court or the House of Lords, as it used to be called, uh, all on the question of whether an insolvent company could adjudicate as a matter of principle. And the answer is yes, an insolvent company can adjudicate. Absolutely. There is no prohibition on an insolvent company bringing an adjudication. Um, so um, cheers all around for the insolvency practitioners, in particular certain companies who were acting for the in, um, insolvency practitioners trying to recover money. The problem is the Supreme Court said you can bring an adjudication. The Supreme Court left open whether you can actually get your money. So then we move on to John Doyle. So John Doyle went to the Court of Appeal 
um, and perhaps put it in context how, the, how long these things can take. Um, Erith were appointed by BAM on the Olympic Park. Erith appointed John Doyle to carry out hard landscaping, and John Doyle went into insolvency in 2013. This case eventually reaches the Court of Appeal in 2021, I believe, or maybe 22. Um, so it takes some time to get there. What you had, again, classic scenario, one party saying it overpaid, one party saying they were underpaid. <clears throat> John Doyle say they were underpaid by 1.2 million. And in this case, the adjudicator found in favor of John Doyle. So the adjudicator had taken place when John Doyle was in liquidation. As we know now, that is permitted to bring an adjudication if you are insolvent. The question is, are you entitled to be paid your money? It went to the Court of Appeal and fortunately, their Lord Justice Coulson now sits in the Court of Appeal and he's quite a sensible judge. Um, and in effect, what he says is there is an interrelationship between construction law, insolvency and adjudication. And as Lucy's already mentioned, Melville Dundas was a case where the courts had to grapple with which takes precedence, insolvency or the Construction Act. And the courts decided Insolvency Act takes precedence. Now, what that effectively means is the courts will put the insolvency rights, the, the rights of creditors to set off other sums they are owed ahead of what you might call a smash and grab adjudication. So the net effect of John Doyle is not that it prohibits absolutely payment of an adjudication decision if you are insolvent, but it makes it extremely difficult to be paid if you are an insolvent company, even though you have the right to bring an adjudication, to actually get paid is a different issue. So it does beg the question why people are bothering. But, you know, turn it on its head, as I said at the start of this section, what is you know, fundamentally, if a party is entitled to money, why shouldn't it be paid just because it's insolvent? Um, that is a picture on that slide of Pythagoras. Um, as far as I was concerned, he was the guy that did triangles. But um, there is a company called Pythagoras who um, are in the market and they are acting typically for liquidators seeking to recover money via adjudication where, where construction companies go into insolvency. And anyone involved in any large construction company will probably <laughs> have come across Pythagoras by now. <clears throat> so Pythagoras were the company who took the decision of Bresco all the way to Supreme Court and won. They were the, the company that was involved with John Doyle and lost. So what Pythagoras are trying to do is, is recover sums for liquidators where the companies are insolvent using adjudication. And as I've just explained in John Doyle, the court are basically saying adjudication is the wrong process. They're not saying you can't do it, but they are making it so difficult to recover the money that adjudication almost becomes redundant and you need to go to a normal court case. And another recent example is on the screen, J.A. Ball and St. Philip's Homes. Exactly the same scenario as John Doyle. The money is potentially owed, albeit there's a cross claiming um, from the house builder saying, I'm owed money more than they owe, you know, I owe them. And what the court have done in that scenario is said, well, okay, we need, we need to, we're not going to pay you you need to go away and decide this in a normal court claim and therefore it's been stayed for six months. <clears throat> so what the court are doing effectively is imposing an obligation on a court claim to decide the outcome, not an adjudication. That's not to say if you get served with an adjudication from Pythagoras or an equivalent company, you don't need to deal with it. But it is to say that it's, it's very difficult for that party to recover money from you if you have a genuine cross claim. So how does it, how does insolvency manifest itself on site, you know, when it all kicks off? So here's an example. And this is typically what happens. Here. There's a rumor that contractor's in trouble. So progress slows down on site. Employer sits in a room with the directors of the contractor and says, what's going on, you know? And they go, it's all fine. Um, we've got loads of money coming in. Don't worry about it, it's all fine. And then three weeks later, all of a sudden, the employer gets a phone call from the contractor saying, 
uh, we're going into administration, the site's closing tomorrow. This happens all too frequently. At that point, the contract isn't necessarily formally insolvent because what's actually happened is they've issued a notice of intention to appoint rather than actually going into administration. So the employer is left in a bit of limbo because the contractor has effectively closed the site, is not in any form of insolvency, and under JCT, in order to terminate for lack of due diligence, etc., it takes 14 days minimum before you can do anything else. <clears throat> so what do we hear quite a lot of? We hear the client say, well, we talk to the subcontractors, it's okay, they're gonna keep working. We've agreed to pay them direct. That's all fine. Um, one of our subcontractors has agreed to become the main contractor. It's going to be absolutely seamless. We're not going to lose any time at all. Whilst there's going to be no delay, leave it with us. We don't need any lawyers involved. It's all fine. So we hear that quite a lot. Um, what actually happens? Well, some of those subcontractors do carry on and do get paid, but then they want to be paid the sums they're owed by the contractor to continue. Um, the subcontractor who says, I'll take over the works, can't actually get the insurance to take over the works, or it won't take over the works, or, you know, just for whatever reason, won't become the main contractor. And if you have made payments to the subcontractors and you are the employer, then potentially you're breaching the parry pursue rule. But that is, a, you can't prefer a creditor. So if you're paying a subcontractor direct to money that was owed to the main contractor, you still strictly owe the money to the main contractor. So the answer is, you just need to calm down. When a contractor, employer, subcontractor goes into insolvency, there will be a delay. It doesn't have to be an enormous delay, but there will be a delay. So what do you do? And we've already touched on this before. Yeah. If a party is going into insolvency, you need to protect your position. So if you can issue a pay less notice, as we've said, it's not necessarily that important. Um, you need to wait until the contractor goes into formal insolvency before you start taking actions that say this, that or the other. You need to allow that contractor to be formally insolvent. Expect your supply, the suppliers on the site to get dropping because they're going to come along and say, well, I've got all these materials on site. They're mine. They're not. Um, I've come on to retention of title in some of the questions, but they're not the supplier's materials. They are yours if they're on the site. And you need to understand the true position on site because you, you're going to need ultimately to decide at the end what the contractor had completed to enable to work out the figure you may or they may be owed. And you're then going to have to appoint another contractor. And be sensible. We've had a developer who's appointed three contractors and they've all gone bust one after the other now it's, it's nothing to do with the developer because he's not you know they haven't actually really got on with the work but that developer is going for the cheapest price each time well they're the ones who are more likely to go bust work with the key subcontractors and professionals because you will probably be working with them anyway understand there's going to be a month two month delay even if a new contractor you know is appointed quite quickly they're going to need to mobilize and also consider what's going on with your bonds, your guarantees, collateral warranties, because all those documents are necessary for your funders, ultimately. And um, so they need to be considered. And you'll come on to bonds in a moment. It's exactly what you do. Just moving forward, where a company goes into insolvency, you don't want to be the last Charlie that pays someone that goes into it, is in insolvency. So no payments due. And the contracts help you on that you are entitled to use the materials that are on site. Um, invariably, there'll be, you know, if you've got scaffolding involved, your scaffolder will want payment for their scaffolding. Often there's an agreement to be made with the scaffolder where you continue to pay um, the agreed rate. Um, what you do have to do is allow people's personal plan and that on hire to be released to the party that owns it. And as I've said, have a clear assessment of the work completed at the time of insolvency. Now, before I come on to the questions, two further slides, which perhaps um, suggests the timing was particularly um, um, spot on, if you want, as to why we're doing this talk now. 2022, according to um, Christina Fitzgerald, was the year the insolvency dam burst. 
So the underlying corporate insolvencies have gone up 57% in a year. In construction in particular, um, they've gone up like that. Now, you've got that massive spike and that spike is not going to come straight back down again. There is going to be a situation where that's going to keep going up or it's going to flatline before it starts coming back down again. So the construction industry you know, is the industry that demonstrates what's going on with insolvency. And there is a lot of it around. Because there's a lot of it around, you need to understand how to operate your contracts, what to do when it happens. Um, and, you know, whether the timing's ideal, but the timing is, you know, spot on as to what's happening in the market. So without further ado, we're going to go back to this section. We're hopefully going to get both of us there. Now we've had 15 questions already um, from the delegates. So I will probably just go through most of these um, because they're the things that people are asking. So I've read a number of questions on bonds. Um, and Lucy mentioned the ABI bond. So most bonds are based on the Association of British Insurers form of bond. They're not all necessarily a standard ABI bond, but they're based on that in principle. And unamended, an ABI bond says um, the bondsman pays out for breach of contract. And as Lucy's pointed out, insolvency is not a breach of contract. So you need to amend those bonds to make it clear that um, a breach of contract includes insolvency under the contract. It's a standard amendment, but it's an amendment that needs to be made. We've had a question about how you go about calling on a bond. Well, um, if you read the ABI bond, it stops at practical completion. And you might question, well, how can I work out how much money I'm owed at practical completion? Because I haven't completed the work, I haven't done the final account. And that's a valid point. So if your bond does stop, uh, does sort of run out, it should run out later than practical completion. If it doesn't, typically the issue with a bond is you have to call on the bond before the expiry date. You don't actually have to have the figure before the expiry date. So you can still call on the bond. You're making a call on the bond, therefore that effectively stops the clock running. That's, that's the key point. It is also the case that some, you, know, you get lots of different varieties of bonds and some bonds will pay out on adjudication decisions. Some bonds will pay out on project managers decisions. So it depends your form of bond. Some bondsmen will want to do an early deal. So you should get, you know, be in contact with the bond provider. But the key is to make sure you have um, actually put in a call on the bond before the expiry date. Um, one of the other questions we've had, which always comes up, is what happens with materials on site and retention of title clauses? Because you all, you're going to get these comments if, if a contractor goes into insolvency, a subcontractor or a supplier is going to turn up on the site and say, they're my materials, I own them because I've got a retention of title clause with the contractor. And until he pays me, um, they're my materials. Retention of title clauses are complicated. In simple terms, if it's a supply only item, so let's just say it's a bunch of bathroom tiles, 5,000 pounds worth of bathroom tiles just been delivered. Supply has not been paid by the sub, um, main contractor who's gone bust. Um, so supplier says, well, I've got an agreement with the main contractor that says uh, that I have the title in those materials until I'm paid. Absolutely. But under the Sale of Goods Act, title passes on delivery unless you're given notice of a retention of title clause. It's all getting quite complicated. But the employer doesn't have the notice. The, you know, the employer's not got the contract. As far as the employer's concerned, it's had delivery onto its site. They are its materials. So for supply-only items, it's effectively where they are. Supply and install items the law is the other way around. Effectively, you have to have paid for them as the employer before you become entitled to them. And the main contractor has to have paid the subcontractor before you become entitled to them. <clears throat> the truth is, the blunt truth is, if you are the employer on a site and your main contractor goes bust, you 
lock the site, you put on additional security and whatever on that site is what you will own. Um, ignore the sort of legal side to it. What is on this, you know, what is on the site, if you've got it in your port of cabins or whatever, you'll be the one that owns it. And, it, and ultimately there'll be a lot of huffing and puffing from the supply chain for a couple of weeks and then it will all die down again. Um, one for Lucy. Is it okay to amend the 13 week period in an NEC? Yes, you can amend it to whatever you want. So, you, know, you could amend the NEC period to 18 months. You could amend it to say, I suppose the project manager will assess the sum due once the completion is achieved. Um, what you want to make sure is, as Lucy alluded to, perhaps politely, if you are a project manager doing that, you want to be very careful that you don't undervalue the cost of completion because your client is not going to be very happy. And ultimately, your client may well bring a claim against you for failure to sort of value the works properly, which resulted in them overpaying an insolvent contractor who's not going to pay it back. Um, <clears throat> One of the issues that we find with one of the questions is, how do I find out about the insolvency position on a, of a party? Well, some of you are old enough will have, would have heard of the London Gazette. Is there any kind of insolvency, the appointment of an administrator, etc., will find its way into the Gazette? Um, and obviously, if you look on Company's House, give it two or three weeks, it will show on Company's House. Those of you that have credit insurance, you'll probably find out a lot quicker. One thing you can do, uh, you used to be able to call, well, if you still can call the company's court, but you used to be able to call the company's court and ring up and say, is there any pending insolvency issues with Joe Bloggs contractors? And you'd be on that phone for about five hours. Um, and if you were lucky, you'd get through. They'll tell you the answer, but if you were lucky, you'd get through. There is something called CE filing. So it's CE dash file, I think. And if you log into that, um, th that is effectively a online company's court. So you can go into that. You can look up any company once you've registered and that will tell you whether there's a pending winding up petition, pending part seven claim, part eight claim, whatever. So that's a useful tool if you want to find out the sort of position of a particular party. Um, you know, in order to get on top of that, because you're always going to be behind the curve. The other thing I would say is if you find out about the name of an administrator, administrators, liquidators, they're very easy to talk to because their their job is to realise the assets for the creditors. Their job is not to look after the directors who were the original directors of the company. So if you ring them up, they will tell you what's going on. They will tell you what the status of your position is, whether they're in a notice of intention to appoint, whether they've been appointed, whether the liquidation's about to start. So don't be shy of getting hold of them if you can get if you can find out who they are. Another question we've we've had is if an employer pays a subcontractor, and I've, I've mentioned this, is it deemed as a payment under the contract? And the answer to that is no. What we are finding increasingly is arrangements made where employers are paying subcontractors direct, or contractors are paying suppliers direct to avoid money being put paid to the middleman who then doesn't pay it on and goes into insolvency. That's fine. That can be organized, but you have to have it agreed in your contract that payments made direct count as payments under the contract. So payments made direct to a third party. <clears throat> if you don't, as I said, it's deemed a preference and the situation can be that you, you as the employer have paid a subcontractor but you still owe the main contractor that same sum of money. So it's important that if you're going to do that, you have written agreements that agree the principle behind it. If you don't, and as I use the sort of example of what might happen where we get told, it's okay, we've paid the subcontractor, don't worry about it, that can cause problems. So if you're going to do that, you need to do it formally. You know, the subcontractor is not gonna have a problem with that, if they get paid, the main contractor may have a problem with it. Um, but you know, you need to be doing that or need to be organizing the way you pay to avoid 
yourself getting into too much difficulty. Um, one final question, and I'll let Lucy off as this is her first presentation for Archer, so <laughs> she's only got to answer one question. Um, we do, you know, we talked about amendments to contracts, and you often see people amend their contracts. Say, if someone goes into insolvency, I don't have to pay full stop. I'm not. I'm not able to confirm for 100% whether that is a valid clause or not. There is something called an anti-deprivation principle, where if you refuse to pay someone full stop, even though they are entitled to it, then again, it is arguably a preference to other people you are paying. So you need to be slightly careful about how you amend your contract. So having a blanket, you go into insolvency, I don't have to pay you, could ultimately not be a valid clause. So. If you are going to sort of consider how you amend your contracts going forward, which we would advise you do, because the standard forms don't pick up all forms of insolvency. They don't necessarily deal with all the issues that, that people need to deal with when the other party goes into insolvency. Make sure you're careful. It's almost like it's almost like having a cap on liability. Don't push it too far, because ultimately you may run the risk there is no cap. So don't push your right to not pay at all too far because otherwise you might find that that clause gets struck out and you, and you haven't got that type of clause. But finally, as we've got two minutes left, um, we did this talk uh, where we had um, Nick Kuzak of Parker Andrews, unfortunately he couldn't make it today, the last two slides are effectively his slides. And um, we asked him what he sees the next six months and his answer was there are, um, signs that people are removing capital etc from the market and construction tends to lag behind everything else so in a rather sort of depressing end to this webinar um there is likely to be over the next six months a sort of continued wave of insolvency even though the market may be improving it's lagging behind and so be be very careful and be very sort of conscious of, of noticing what's going on, making sure you're on the ball. Um, and if you're placing contracts going forward, consider amending them to you know, give you that added protection. With that, and my voice is just about to go anyway, um, but hopefully I don't sound too much like a, um, no, I shouldn't keep saying that. Nothing wrong with the West Midlands. Um, uh, that's the end of this webinar hopefully that's um interesting and you understand you know a bit more about insolvency than before and any questions feel free to let us know and um i'll finish it now you probably have to fill in some form or something um at the end so if you could do that thanks very much thanks everyone bye, bye.